On this episode of History Hunters, Jeff and Sarah check out America's oldest city, historic St. Augustine, Florida. The couple checks out the Fort Castillo de San Marcos, as well as Robert Ripley's first bizarre, believe it or not, museum. Sarah and I are about to enter one of Robert Ripley's first Believe It or Not museums. It opened in 1950 inside what was once known as the Castle Warden Inn. Born in California in 1890, Robert Ripley was a famous cartoonist, businessman, and amateur anthropologist who exploited oddities found in the human and animal world. He made his way from print to radio and TV. In 1933, he opened his first auditorium collection in Chicago. Ripley had visited the Castle Warden several times in an attempt to buy it out, but he ran out of time. He died in 1949 at the age of 58. After his death, Ripley's estate was able to purchase the concrete mansion and open the auditorium in 1950. You know, when I was a kid, I saw it in San Francisco and I could not figure out how it worked. <laughs> One of the most popular exhibits at Ripley's, believe it or not, the famous redwood log tree, is made from the trunk of a single redwood tree. Lynn Moore stumbled upon the felled 1900-year-old redwood tree and used it for a shelter during a storm. It spent months chiseling out the interior. The tree stood 247 feet high and was 14 feet in diameter. Moore carved four houses from this trunk, and this one at Ripley's was the fourth cut in 1938. It's taxidermied with a uh, balloon. Yeah, the whole thing is may have used oil for his last supper, but B.W. Crawford of Texas used actual pecans. What have we got up here? John Lennon's portrait here was done with puffs of smoke into fabric. If you were fat, you'd look like this. Really big fat. Look at the top one. This magnifying glass does absolutely nothing. So those portraits are made out of barbecue sauce. Barbecue sauce. First, is that supposed to be a real shrunken head? I think it is. She says it's genuine. What's that? Iron Maiden. What is that? Rock band? Is it a rock band? This is truly an example of a man who was screwed in the workplace. There are 19 themed galleries on three floors with over 300 exhibits and artifacts of the old and unusual from around the world. Legend has it that in April 1944, two young women died in a fire in this weird building. This wooden model of the space station was made from 276,000 matchsticks, believe it or not. And then, two headed by the six And my favorite, Mike the Headless Chicken. I told you about that story. How does he live without a head? He had a brainstem attached to him. And they had to feed him with an eyedropper. There. The chicken on display, however, is not the real Mike. On September 10th, 1945, Fruta, Colorado farmer Floyd Olson was lopping off the head of this chicken, but it wouldn't die. Its life had been spared temporarily by a chunk of its brain stem that still remained attached. There's a two-headed lamb. At six foot, Sarah is tall for a woman, but dwarfed by Robert Wadlow, who stood at eight foot 11. Known as the Alton Giant and the Giant of Illinois, Robert was taller than his dad by age eight. His gawky frame and 490 pounds of weight made walking difficult. Robert Wallow's clothing contained three times the fabric of the normal man's clothing, and especially made shoes where a man sized 37. Robert died in 1940 at the age of 22. 
Next to Sarah here is the likeness of Walter Hudson, who set the world record for the largest waist at 109 inches. His heaviest weight was 978 pounds. He died in 1991 at the age of 41. Oh, look at that freak. He's a real guy. He's a real guy? This thing is a real guy, but this guy exists in real life. And he tattooed himself into the lizard man. Yeah. Shaved his teeth down, put these little bumps under him, split his tongue. Eric Sprague, known as the Lizard Man, is a pioneer of body modification and modern sideshow. For over 20 years, he has exhibited his modifications and performed an extensive repertoire of sideshow stunts around the world. Go ahead. Bug your eyes out. Oh, see, there he is. Look, he's coming. <laughs> the fiberglass form here represents the figure of the late Robert Earl Hughes, who long held the world's record as the heaviest human being. Because the Indiana man topped out the scales at 1,041 pounds, it's not surprising that he didn't live long. He died in 1958 at the age of 32. Known as Half Man, Johnny Eck was born with a truncated torso due to a birth defect. Living from 1911 to 1991, Johnny became a famous freak show performer. He appeared in a number of movies and Tarzan films where he played a bird creature. Crocodile Man was none other than Bobby Blackburn of Australia. He died in 1989. What did he do? File his teeth out? That's what that guy did. Oh, he wears dentures of crocodile teeth. This was one of the golf balls smuggled to the moon by astronaut Alan Shepard aboard Apollo 14. They got more dirt than ball this time. That looked like a slice to me, Al. There we go. Astronaut Edgar Mitchell carried the Bible to the moon on this microfilm. That's the life mask of Abraham Lincoln. Genuine. Of oh, arrows through bottles. Modified hand. This hand over 4,000 years old was taken from the tomb of a new priestess. These are Chinese slippers at the age of three. Daughters of wealthy families had their feet purposely broken and bound so tightly their toes touched their heels. The ideal foot was a mere three inches long and was crushed into a shape resembling the Chinese lotus flower. I guess I'm glad I'm not born a Chinese woman, huh? That is supposed to be a lock of Kennedy's hair. Just two strands, big deal. I found this exhibit creepy. Ancient Egyptians worshipped cats as deity, and this one was no exception. In preparation for the afterlife, it was mummified 2,000 years ago. To deal with this. Takes a picture, this dude looks real. He just took a picture of this chick over here. Who's not real either. Ripley's didn't take long to view, and we wanted to see the rest of St. Augustine, so we paid for the red train tram tour. 15-foot high wall surrounded four block wide, 22 block long colonial city. A replica of that wall is off to the right of the train. Originally 15 foot tall. Now it made a left hand turn around the end of this intersection here and headed south 22 blocks. All along the outside of our city at one time, yeah. And to protect the folks inside the city, 
So they built the city gates here, put a drawbridge in between there. They lowered down, of course, in the daytime when it was safe to hunt, gather, and explore, and even defend. Well, they'd raise it up at night, and guess what? Once it was up, they weren't going to lower it down till the following morning. Located at 14 George Street in St. Augustine is purportedly the oldest wooden schoolhouse in America. The exact date of construction is not known, but it first appears on tax records in 1716. By the way, there remains no wooden buildings in St. Augustine built prior to 1702 when the British burned the city. For lunch, we ducked into the Milltop Tavern on St. George Street and enjoyed the two-story view. It's raining, and a minute ago it was sunny. There's the mill from the, the mill top. Well, what should we do? Now, when we turn left, the church right across the street that'll be on our right, okay. that's the first Protestant church um, in the state of Florida, Trinity Episcopal Parish. And since we got a moment right behind it, when we get along there, you'll see a Wells and Fargo bank. Now that was originally a World War store for young black men called the St. Augustine Four. They went in there and they were arrested for the terrible crime of ordering a cheeseburger from a whites only restaurant. Unfortunately, the governor of Florida stepped in and commuted their sentence. But that lunch counter is still inside there. There's some historical markers. When the bank is open, you can go in there, check that out for free. St. Augustine was ground zero in the pivotal struggle for civil rights. Jim Crow laws were prevalent in Florida, but several incidences ignited the struggle for equal rights. On July 18, 1963, black citizens tried to take a seat at the lunch counter at Woolworths in defiance of laws barring blacks from establishments. Four teenagers were arrested for sitting at an all-white lunch counter and ordering food. The four were jailed until January after they refused to halt their public protests. The incident was justifiably publicized as an egregious injustice. It took special action of Governor Ferris Bryant to free them in January 1964. I'm not trying to tell St. Augustine how to solve its problems. I am trying to help it set up the mechanics for solving its problems. The racist policies of America's oldest city attracted the attention of the NAACP and Reverend Martin Luther King. In the summer of 1964, King went to Florida. When he tried to dine at the Monson Motor Lodge restaurant on June 11th, he was told the restaurant wasn't integrated and would have to leave. We are engaged in a righteous struggle to make our man a better man and make it possible for all of us to live together as brothers. Do you think that if Reverend King, I'd like to prevail on you in behalf of my wife and my family, my two young daughters and myself who are trying to operate a business here, prevail upon you to uh, encourage your uh, non-violent army to peacefully uh, uh, solicit uh, some other property other than mine. As you know, I've uh, uh, unfortunately had to arrest 84 people here since Easter. King refused and the owner had the group arrested for trespassing. In protest, a swimming was held at the hotel pool. The owner of the hotel was enraged by the unwanted attention and tried to flush out the trespassers by pouring muriatic acid into the pool. The Monson Motel and Restaurant were raised in 2003 and replaced by a Hilton. However, the stairs leading to the entrance of the former restaurant where King was arrested have been kept in place with a historical marker as a lesson for us all. The pool remains as it was in 1964. I'm very sad to say we cannot turn down the oldest street in the United States, Ovalley Street. We're doing some work on a building down there right now. But definitely check that out. Originally that was called Hospital Street. It's very beautiful. One of our most popular museums is down there, the Spanish Military Hospital Museum. Now usually you have to pay to tour this. It is free today. It is not a guided tour like it is usually today because usually they guide you in that oldest house, the oldest house in St. Augustine, soon to have the newest roof in St. Augustine. So we are checking out an old Spanish fort that dates back to the 1600s. It was actually sacked by a North Carolina governor. Oh, this is the moat. Oh, there's the... We 
all know that Christopher Columbus claimed America for Spain in 1492, with others following. Explorer Juan Ponce de Leon shipwrecked near Augustine in 1513 and tried to colonize, but was fought back by American Indians. The French also arrived to conquer the new land, and so did the English. For a time, the Spanish had a foothold on Florida, and to keep what was theirs, they built a massive fort, the Castillo de San Marcos, in 1672. Construction took place for 23 years and was completed in 1695. Many Spanish forts had preceded the Castillo. However, this one made of coquina was impenetrable to enemy attack and was fire resistant. That's where the soldiers slept. Nothing to it. Uh, we got our, we're all spoiled with our pillow top. <laughs> no kidding. Let's go upstairs, that'd be cool. We are top of the structure, the famous fort. English colonists in the Carolina colonies were hostile towards Spain. Led by Colonel James Moore, the Carolinians and their Creek Indian allies attacked Spanish Florida in 1702 and destroyed St. Augustine. However, they could not capture the fort. The British attacked the fort again in 1728 and 1740. This is cool up here, huh? Look, forest is mowing the lawn. Forest. Arr, bless them to kingdom come. The fort's walls are made of coquina, a soft limestone formed almost entirely of sorted and cemented fossil debris, most commonly coarse shells and shell fragments. When General Oglethorpe tried his hand against St. Augustine in 1740 and bombarded the Castillo for 27 days, its walls held firm. You can't get any older in American history than this place. It was a land swap that put Florida under British rule in 1763. For 20 years, the British held the fort, which was used as a military prison during the Revolutionary War, and at one time held three signers of the Declaration of Independence. They were Thomas Hayward, Arthur Middleton, and Edward Rutledge. An ingenious toilet flushing system was built into the fort, one which allowed the ties to bring in seawater for, you know, and twice a day to wash human waste into the ocean. It's a little sweaty and warm today. This looks like original H.B. Smith. Cleveland, Ohio, sister. Oh wow, did you see these? Alex Carter, 1883. King of Spain. Wants you to sign up for this Spanish army. Sign up here and collect your pay of one, two, escudo. A gold Dublin. Dublin. Dublin? Oh. What did I say? Dubloon? Oh, it's Dubloon. I don't know, but it's hotter than the furnaces of hell today. At the end of the war, Florida was returned to Spain in 1784 until Florida became a U.S. territory in 1821. Most trouble making red coats. <laughs> what is that? An old cannon? Right there. Oh, deadly explosion. This was a historic piece of a 3,000 pound cannon that was fired and exploded during the 1702 siege staged by the British against the Spanish. Three men were killed when this barrel exploded. This piece was recovered in the moat surrounding the fort. The original Sally port door. An exhibit explains the mechanics of raising and lowering the drawbridge. This is the ticket, it's air conditioned. What? This is the ticket, it's air conditioned. Where are we 
out. Loch Ness Monster comes out. Godzilla will rampage St. Augustine. We got piranhas in there. We have sharks with lasers on their heads. And that's all a lie. We only put water in it once. See the big cracks in the wall? That's what happened. On your left, Pirate and Treasure Museum. Cannot say enough nice stuff about it. It's also a love tree. It's a Florida live oak with a palm tree growing right out of the center of it. So if you kiss under this tree, you'll be with that person forever. All right, let's move on. Let's talk National Geographic. Over the last few years, year we've been voted the number one city in America to go to college and graduate and never leave. I'm down here every morning taking advantage of the fountain. the whole experience depending on your time you'll take anywhere from 90 minutes to two hours it's a fun tour you can't go wrong with that though we decided to forego the $15 a head entry fee and skip drinking the water certain that nobody has stayed young for lack of proof before heading west we made a brief stop at the Atlantic Ocean Pacific Ocean. Uh, By a 